Welcome to the Stone Choir Podcast. I am Corey J. Mahler. And I'm still woe. On this episode of Stone Choir, we're going to be doing something that we have not done previously. Uh, We were asked by the folks at Antelope Hill if they would discuss one of their publications with us, a book that they've published. And we're happy to do that. Uh, It's not something anyone's ever asked us to do before. Uh, I'm excited about it. It was a very interesting book to read. I was happy to read it. It's kind of funny looking at the table of contents and then reading through it. It's in a lot of ways, it's kind of a, an overview of much of the content that Stone Choir has covered in our first year of producing this podcast. So I think that the specific subject of today's book, which is titled The Sword of Christ by Giles Corey, very much dovetails with kind of the home turf for Stone Choir. Uh, today with us also for the first time, we have a guest from the editorial team at uh, Antelope Hill. So uh, if you just introduce yourself and your company, I'm curious, how did you come to reach out to us and how did you come to publish this book in particular and why do you think it would be a good fit? Certainly. So uh, my name is Taylor. I'm part of the editorial team at Antelope Hill. That's kind of a, a long question, but we, we published the book because it we find that that it fits our mission. And um, we were started about three years ago. Now we just recently celebrated our third birthday with the intention of making available books that are difficult to obtain or censored or ones that just aren't available in English and specifically in the the, um, rightist political tradition and that have to do with the philosophy and history of Europe and its diaspora. So that's where it started and and since then we've really in in our based on our expectations we've been um, amazingly successful in the kinds of works that we've been able to translate as well as the kinds of uh, authors that we've been able to inspire to come publish with us so I, I personally don't remember exactly how this one ended up with us but as soon as we got it we I was actually one of the people who reviewed it initially and I was very very interested so you know, within kind of our our mission statement, we'll we'll publish different authors. We've published uh, uh, Protestant authors, Catholic authors, secular authors as well. Um, but it, you know, as long as it contributes toward that goal of of making available books that have important um, ideas and important facts, and that can make a contribution to understanding the history and uh, contributing to the current struggle of our people, then it's something we're interested in. So me personally, I, uh, I'm a Protestant in the Calvinist tradition. So for that, I actually don't remember. I, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I don't remember off the top of my head if uh, um, Giles Corey necessarily approaches this, this book from a specific um, uh, Christian tradition and, and what it is. But I mean, I think that's, that recommends it in some ways because um, the topics he deals with are relevant to all of Christendom and all of uh, Christian history, especially European and white Christian history. So in a lot of ways, it is exactly the kind of book that I've always thought should exist, one that deals very specifically with issues like Christian Zionism and uh, addresses the interaction between ethno-nationalism and Christianity and kind of is intended as a weapon to help us come to grips with the extreme liberalization that's taken place uh, in the church. And as to uh, why I'm here, well, I mean, I was I've been aware of you guys and your podcast for a while now. Uh, back when I um, had a Twitter account before uh, Elon banned me again, um, I followed you guys. I checked out a couple of the podcasts, and I just thought that honestly, it would be something that I think, like you said, it would be interesting to you and your audience, just based off of how similar it is to uh, what you guys talk about. So. Very happy and very grateful to have the opportunity to come on here and uh, share it with you guys. We appreciate your time. And uh, I've, I was taking a look through the catalog from Antelope Hill. Your, your name has come up for, I think, pretty much since you came on the scene. And it's very an interesting collection. Obviously, as you said, you know, most, the vast majority of the books, I think, are focused specifically on politics. And there tends to be, at least cursorily, it looks like there was a lot of focus around kind of the history of fascism and and things around that in the 20th century, which is valuable because that's one of those things that's such a 
a dirty word. You know, people use it as an epithet, but no one can define it. And so I'm very grateful that you've produced and published and reprinted a number of works that, you know, are just in many cases from the men who were on the ground in those days. So I would I would commend folks who are listening. We'll obviously put a link in the show notes to this book. And I should say up front, uh, we're not getting paid anything for this. We want nothing for it. They asked, and so we're happy to do it. Um, I think that's probably the approach we'll always take. I mean, this is a a fringe podcast that has no monetary value, really. And so I honestly would not want to be in a situation where I wanted someone's commercial success to be hinged to what people thought of our podcast. So in the future, you know, with this or anything else we ever do or refer, if if we're going to get anything from it, we'll tell you, we'll be transparent. But this is just entirely because it's such a great, uh, there's so much synergy between again, the, the topic of this book and what Ann Lowe Pill is trying to do. I want to just briefly read the introduction to the book because it it is really in a lot of ways almost kind of one of the underlying mission statements of Stone Choir as well. Uh, this is from the, the preface by Giles Corey. The hatred for Christianity on the right truly pains me. This is the reason that I wrote this book. I fully understand the hatred, for as I argue in my introductory essay, there's very little to praise about organized Christianity today. If anything, organized Christianity, including the Catholic Church and each of the Protestant denominations, has indeed become yet another instrument of white genocide. Organized Christianity has capitulated and bent the knee to Satan's coalition of the damned, thereby turning its back on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I despise the organized Christianity too for this reason. But usurp though the mantle of the church may be, that is no reason to simply abandon the faith. So many of us who observe the collapse of the church into anti-white leftism have been led to the facile conclusion that Christianity itself is irredeemable. It isn't. Christianity does not even need redemption, for our faith remains what it has always been. The pharisaical teachers of false doctrine, whom we witness on parade today, simply are not Christians, no matter what they may say. Remember Paul's warning, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if the ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works, from 2 Corinthians 11. And he continues on the next page. The same sense of illiteracy lies behind the more absurd contention that Christianity is some far-off, life-denying, suicidal Jewish psyop. First, if this was true, why, after nearly 2,000 years, did organized Christianity only betray its race and civilization in the 20th century, after the Jewish coup that was accomplished in no small part by the creation and promotion of the heresy of Christian Zionism? So that's really kind of the the thesis of the book itself. I do take issue with the phrase organized religion, uh, organized Christianity. That's a modern term that emerged in the 20th century, really as things were starting to go to pot. But I think he's absolutely correct when he recognizes that when those on the right who are not Christian critique Christianity, they're only looking at what it is now and not what has been for 1900 years. And so I'm in complete agreement with the author that them, that's the thesis of, of Stone Choir as well. Christianity doesn't change. So if we have problems today caused by doctrine changing, that's what we need to fix. And personally, I think that it's it's one of the weaknesses that a lot of modern discourse has. From the pagan right, you have folks saying, well, Christianity did this. And then there are folks who, who agree with the author and say, well, that's only the organized portion. That's just like denominations or whatever. I don't take that view. And I, to be clear, when when we go through this and we level criticisms and critiques of some of the things, it's in no way saying it's a bad book. It's a really good book. And in particular, I just wanted to highlight this up front because it doesn't really color his actual conclusions or his arguments, but it's a term that he uses that we hear a lot. And you had mentioned earlier, you weren't sure if he came from a particular denominational background. He, he never says this at any point in the book. Um, he does speak favorably of uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, but I didn't get the sense that he was Eastern Orthodox. But again, it, it's immaterial to the book. So this is this is why we're all here. I want the future of our people to be a Christian future, and I want to be one where our people are intact, where our race is intact. And I'm very thankful that Anne Lopil has published this book because you know not many of the books are, even if some are by Christian authors, 
they're not overly about Christian subjects, which is fine. But part of the reason that Corey and I started Stone Choir was to inject Christian discussions from informed Christian men into a space where it's largely absent. And most of what we do see from Christian men is completely disastrous. So I, that's that's just the introduction of the book, and I think it's a very good introduction to what it is we're going to be talking about here today. From reading through the book and really looking at the citations or the references and also the ones that were not included notably, I get the general sense that he is reformed of some variety, although I couldn't necessarily say that I know which particular one, but that would be my takeaway as to which tradition to which he belongs. However, that's not really what comes through in the book. He's not making a specific argument for any particular Christian tradition, which is why when I hear a critique of organized religion or organized Christianity, I really hear echoes of point 24 of the 25-point program of the National Socialists, the notorious one, as it were, about positive Christianity, because it's the same general sense. It's opposition to the corrupted and subverted churches of the day as organizations. So organizational in that sense. I wouldn't take it to mean necessarily that organized Christianity is a problem. I don't think that he's advocating that. I know that there are those who do advocate that, and that's wrong. The church is an organization. The church has always been an organization. The church will always be an organization. The fact that the modern organizational church, the various corporate entities, have been subverted, does not mean that the organization of the church is the problem. And I'm not saying that he's arguing that. I don't believe that he is. It's the same sort of problem that was faced in the previous century, where the church had also been subverted, not to the same degree as today. Certainly the churches today have been more subverted. Satan has had more time to perfect the same sort of subversion, really. It's not even of a different kind. It's just taken to a different degree. It's taken to a different level. Because, again, he's had more time to perfect it, and he has more men working for him now, unfortunately. But as for the the book itself, I, I also would recommend it. It is a good book. It is worth reading. I will note, we did get our copies for free. So that is, insofar as there's any sort of incentive we had, we got a copy for free. But that's for us, that's not an incentive. I would have bought the book anyway. And quite frankly, if we got a book for free and didn't like it, we would tell you that. Because, well, that's just the sort of people we are. I think everyone listening to this podcast knows by now that we're quite comfortable saying that a book is not good if it's not good. In this case, of yeah, course... We're not they're... exactly fam <laughs> We're not famous for mincing words. Uh, no, that's. I don't think anyone tunes in to hear us add nuance. When it comes to this book, there are obviously, there are some things with which we are going to disagree, particularly as, it's not even necessarily particularly as Lutherans, but maybe, maybe as magisterial Protestants, there will be a handful of things, but he doesn't really get into specifics of denominational distinctive say, or any of that. That's not the point of the book. The general points, the general chapter and section headings are things with which any Christian should be able to agree. And the same holds for almost all of his concluding points in the last bit. He has eight points that he goes through. The main parts of the book are the Christian questions. So Christianity as it relates to the, to the West, as it relates to the white race. Is Christianity a positive? Is Christianity a negative? That's relevant for all Christians. That's relevant for anyone living in the West. It's relevant for anyone who is white. And then there's, of course the heresy of Christian Zionism, we would agree. That's how we would phrase that. Incidentally, that's one of the things where we have not yet done an episode. We've discussed it. It's come up tangentially. But we will do an episode on that. We will try to do it in the near future because obviously, for various reasons, it is quite relevant today. And as we go down the list, there all of these things are salient issues in the church today with which any Christian, any I'm just going to say any Christian, I'd say any Christian on our side, but there are no Christians on the other side. So any Christian should be able to agree with these things. And yes, we're going to have some minor differences and perhaps, dare I use the word nuance, but by and large, 
this is a good book for an overview of many of the things we have been discussing on various episodes during the course of the past year, and just in general, things that are relevant to the political right, specifically with regard to Christianity. His mission statement talks about how those who carry the false doctrines that he talks about simply are not Christians. And when I was reading the book, that really stood out to me because it echoed something that I had experienced a lot. I've I've been a Christian my whole life. Um, I used to be a lot more uh, a Pentecostal, kind of came from that branch, uh, I guess you would say. And obviously there's, you know, we can all understand there's a lot of kind of temperamentally conservative or politically conservative Christians who, you know, they'll they'll see things like um, some denomination or like some some church um, out there will, you know, accept uh, homosexuality or they'll um, accept uh, um, having gay uh, clergy um, or they'll promote Black Lives Matter or something like that. And they'll um, they'll reject it, of course, they, they'll say that that's wrong and, and they'll say, well, those people just aren't Christians. And in my experience, what they mean when they say that is it's it's a dismissal of the fact that there's any battle to be fought at all, basically. It's it's just saying, well, I'm I'm saying in my mind to myself that like this person just doesn't count as uh, as a Christian and therefore I don't have to worry about it. And it's it's not my problem. Um, and it's probably also just comes from a feeling of powerlessness because both politically and probably theologically that they don't feel like they have a theological justification for fighting it. Um, so in in my mind, I think it is important for ordinary Christians like that to understand that while it, I obviously agree that, you know, when you identify false doctrines, it's it's appropriate to say that, that at some point those people simply are not Christians because they are not living out Christianity. At the same time, as I think the author recognizes, there is such a thing as, as just Christianity as a whole, as a phenomenon that's present in the culture and society. And if it, it was pretty much what he discusses, at least in the, the first part of the book, the way that it is um, increasingly manifesting as an anti-white force. I think it's just important to understand that that you know that that is the perception that a lot of people have of Christianity when they when they think of Christianity that that's the only reference point for it that they have um, and this really does call us to uh, fight against that and to um, reform it or you know destroy it or, or how, whatever um, however you may want to put it um, but I think that in my own experience, this is a question that I think is is very difficult for a lot of Christians to uh, think about and grapple with. And I think, um, again, one thing that I like about the book is how direct it is at addressing this and saying, well, you know, we're not rejecting the faith. We are, in fact, embracing and uh, putting forth the true faith. Um, and it is important to do this because that which calls itself Christianity, that cultural manifestation, that cultural phenomenon that calls itself Christianity is increasingly just has has absolutely nothing to do with what Christianity really is. Yeah, I agree completely. It's necessary for faithful men to stand and fight where we are, whatever denomination that is in, as these things come among us. We have to do something about it. We can't just, you're right, we can't just say, well, that guy's irrelevant because he has bad doctrine. Well, if they're in positions of power, then they're going to do unspeakable harm with with their power. Uh, the first chapter, Christianity Today, uh, begins by discussing the complicity of all the major denominations in the so-called refugee crisis, which is, it is a crisis, it's a civilizational crisis, but these are not refugees. These are, for the churches, they're money makers. These are industrial operations where they are getting paid by states and by other NGOs, including Lutherans, Lutherans, Catholics, Methodists. Pretty much everybody is in on the grift, and they're doing it in the name of God. They're using false scriptural arguments to say, yes, we must overrun Europe and we must overrun America and anywhere that any white homelands on the planet must necessarily be overrun by the third world because Jesus, because Jesus went to Egypt. Therefore, you need infinity Africans in your country. And whatever happens to your community and your family, well, you know, you should just love them. And that's that's not a gospel matter. 
that's a it's a huge problem. It is it is a seminal problem. It's one of the as he says in the preface, as we've said elsewhere, it's one of the principal reasons that a lot of guys on the right who are maybe they've left the church or were never in the church actively hate Christianity because that's all that they see. And I absolutely agree. It's necessary to document this is evil and it's coming from inside our own house as Christians, but it is not Christian. And so in the first chapter, he does a good job laying out kind of the some of the history and the basic details of those things happening. The other part of that that's a, a key part of the whole argument that, that runs throughout much of the book is that anti-racism is a core of the religion that these people espouse as they import the third world rapists and murderers into our neighborhoods. And he holds up as an example the Southern Baptist Convention, which is similarly conservative to the LCMS, and has been going down very much the same path as, as our denomination has in the last few years. I was fascinated. I, I never really pay attention to other, other denominations too much, and so I've, I was ignorant of some of these things. But there were a few Russell Moore quotes that he introduced beginning about 2015 through 2017, and then I think a bit newer than that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read these, but the reason they, they smacked me in the face was some of them are virtually verbatim the attacks from within the LCMS leadership against Corey and me for Stone Choir. So the, these are from Russell Moore in the Southern Baptist Convention. He writes, Many of those who have criticized Mr. Trump's vision for America have faced threats and intimidation from the, quote, alt-right of white supremacists and nativists who hide behind avatars on social media. Another quote, at his 2017 meeting, the Southern Baptists adopted another noxious resolution, quote, on the anti-gospel of alt-right white supremacy. That's pretty much verbatim from the screed that Matt Harrison released in February attacking us. And the last quote I wanted to mention, the church should call white supremacy what it is, terrorism. But more than terrorism, white supremacy is Satanism. Even worse, <laughs> even worse than Satanism, white supremacy is a devil worship that often pretends that it is speaking for God. With false sobriety, Moore closed his editorial by stating, quote, white supremacy angers Jesus of Nazareth. The question is, does it anger his church? And this is, again, this, these were charges leveled against Corey and me by the leadership of the Missouri Synod. They called the FBI and accused us of terrorism for talking about this stuff. So I was fascinated to see Russell Moore saying the same thing about Baptists. It's the same playbook. It's exactly the same slander, the same lies. Inter interestingly, as uh, the Stone Choir Telegram chat has grown, a number of people who have joined have told me both there and privately and elsewhere that one of the episodes of Stone Choir that introduced them to us and kind of got them hooked in some cases was the four-hour death march that we did describing the events that the Missouri Senate had taken against the four men who initially exposed some of the most current evil going on within our denomination. And they it resonated with them from other denominations because they've seen the same thing. So I very much appreciated Giles' mention of a lot of these things just because to me they were, it was the first time I was seeing them. It was no surprise because, of course, we all know that these guys are running a playbook, and it's not it, it's a supernatural playbook, which is why I, I doubt that Russell Moore hangs out with Matt Harrison, yet when it comes to spiritually, they are bosom buddies. They have the same God, and they're preaching the same religion, but it's not a Christian religion. So it's there's a, there's a great deal of research that he has done in this book that I find very valuable because it's filling in a lot of blanks that, personally, I didn't, I wasn't aware of, and I think for readers who pick up the book, I think that it will do a really good job of fleshing out exactly what's going on with the so-called refugee crisis. You know, you see these things on TV and you see them showing up and, you know, how, how are there Somalis in Minnesota? Well, it's because of the Catholics and the Lutherans in Minnesota that explicitly imported them. Yes, the government helped and the government, you know, was doing some of it, but it was church bodies that were doing the rest. And they're doing that not only in our name, but they're doing it with our money. And so I think that as, as readers read through this book, which again, we commend, I hope that I'd love to see, you know, Stone Choir listeners sell this thing out just because it's an important asset for folks to have, to have some of the material just lay out, here's exactly what's been going on. And it's a great resource because it's a book that's in, you know, in one thing that you could hand to someone else. 
in many ways, a synopsis of a lot of things that we cover on Stone Choir. So as we've said before, the nice thing about having a podcast or a book or an article is you can hand it to a friend kind of noncommittally. You don't have to say, this is the most important thing in the world. You have to agree with every word of this. You can just say, hey, check this out. There's some amazing stuff in here. I'm not even sure what to think. That's a, it's a nice passive way of, of broaching a subject that can be very upsetting and just say, look, these seem like facts to me when I look stuff up, it checks out. I'm glad you mentioned the the longest episode we've done, and quite frankly, probably the longest episode we will do, because we'll do what we've done with other topics, split them into multiple episodes into a series if we're going to go that long on a particular subject. That one, it made sense to simply sit down and get it done, to do it in one go. But we really went through and aired the dirty laundry of our synod, our church, because it's important. These are things that are being done in our name, and as Woe said, with our money, but they're also being done in public to a certain degree. Yes, they'd like to keep some of this underhanded. They don't want you to know exactly what they're doing, but these are public sins, and public sins have to be rebuked publicly. You do not go to a man privately, you can do this as well, but you do not exclusively go to a man privately to rebuke him for his public sins. For his public sins, you rebuke him publicly. And the reason we see this agreement across denominations, across traditions, across churches, with men who do not talk to one another, who probably, in some cases, don't even know of the existence of one another, unless perhaps Russell Moore happened to see the fact that Matt Harrison spoke before Congress at one point. These are not men who attend the same country clubs. They obviously don't attend the same churches. The reason they have this same script is, as we have said in a number of episodes, I'm not going to go and search so I know how many times we've used the phrase, but there is an animating intelligence behind all of this evil. Satan is running a playbook, and he has developed it over a course of millennia. He has perfected it at this point. Satan, at the very least, seems to believe that he is in the end game. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We are not going to speculate on whether or not that's the case. Woe is going to lean more toward it being the end game. I'm going to lean more in the other direction. One of the few places where we disagree a little bit. But no man knows the day or the hour. Satan seems to be acting as if he's playing for all the marbles right now. And so he has all of his pieces in play. He has all of his units on the board. That's why we see the full court press. That's why we see this happening in every single denomination and tradition. And that's an important point. The churches have been the very last thing to be subverted. Oftentimes, if you're speaking to a neo-pagan or someone who has a particular animus toward the church, perhaps with warrant, I won't say it's unwarranted, but has this particular hatred of the church, will point out that the modern churches have been subverted. And it's true. But show me something in our society that has not been subverted. The churches held out the longest. They were subverted last. All of the things we've gone over in previous episodes when it comes to subversion of the culture and corruption of all of our institutions happened before the church was corrupted. The church stood against this for a very long time. Satan has been trying all these attacks for centuries. The church has rebuffed them all until today. He finally figured out the best way to subvert the church, and he is actively working to do so, to, com to bring that to completion. And that is the war that we're actually fighting. Because if he wins over the churches in sort of a full sense, if he wins that particular engagement, if he wins that battle of the larger war, then he's won. Because the church is, in point of fact, the last bastion, the last thing standing against his complete victory. And Taylor, you mentioned the issue where, what is a Christian, basically, is the, the question. What does it mean for someone to be a true Christian or a false Christian? Is there such a thing as a false Christian? Are these people who hold these false beliefs Christians or not? And we went over this 
in the episode on the Jews, the first in the series specifically dealing with the Jews, episode 34, and that is the No Scotsman fallacy. We went over it there, but I'll go over it again briefly here. There is such a thing as a Christian. Just as there is such a thing as a Scotsman, the reason that you have the fallacy is because there is such a thing as the thing to which you are applying the fallacy. To make that clearer, a Scotsman is a member of the nation, of the race, of the Scottish. If you find a Scottish man who does something you don't like and say, oh, well, he's no true Scotsman. No, he's still a Scotsman. You just don't like what he's doing. But that doesn't change the fact there is such a thing as a Scotsman. If there is an Indian in Scotland, he's not a Scotsman. No matter if he's doing things you like or don't. He's probably doing things you don't like. But he's not a Scotsman. There is such a thing, though. The same thing applies to Christianity. In the case of the Scotsman, it is a matter of blood. In the case of Christianity, it is a matter of tenets. Because Christianity is a religion. It is an ideology in the broader sense of that term. It has a number of tenets, core ones, to which you must assent, to which you must agree, or you are not a Christian. Because that is the definition of what it means to be a Christian. Conveniently, the Church, historically, has reduced this to the confessions, to the creeds. We are able to point to something and say, this is what it means to be a Christian. And to a man, every single one of our enemies cannot actually recite the creeds and believe what he's saying, because he fundamentally rejects things in the creeds. Now, of course, as we have brought up a number of times in the past on this show, Satan has figured out that it is more effective for him to attack the church from the side. Basically, he's flanking the church. As Woe pointed out in a previous episode, you have the Maginot line, Satan is going around it. He's not going to just smash his face into the wall. He's not going to attack us on, for instance, the deity of Christ. He's tried that in the past, centuries past. The creeds have made very clear what we believe with regard to that. Read the Athanasian Creed. However, that is not where Satan is attacking us today, because that's where we have our defenses. We have very good defenses for those big heresies of the past, the things where you had someone who denied that Christ is God, or said Christ was created, or said that there are three essences, or any of a number of things. We have all of the responses to these reduced to formulae that we can recite, that we do recite in church. And that's good, because we are rejecting the false teachings of the past. As Woe has mentioned before, the reason we have the creeds is because the heresies arose. We would not have needed the creeds if the heresies had not arisen. And so when someone says that, oh, well, the creeds aren't in Scripture, every single part of the creeds is in Scripture. And we've passed around documents before detailing which verses correspond with which parts of the creed. No, the creeds themselves, word for word, are not in Scripture. And the reason for that is, again, the heresy had not arisen yet. You don't need to address the heresy until the heresy is a live issue. Usually a widespread issue, in the case of some of these. And so Satan is attacking us where we don't have a creed. We have responses in Scripture but you actually have to be familiar with Scripture in order to formulate these, in order to respond to what he is doing. And most men are not equipped to do that, and particularly not so when the supposed leaders of the church are deliberately misleading the flock. And so Satan is attacking us on issues like race and nation and what is an enemy, what is a friend, what does it mean to love our enemies? Because these are issues we don't have in a creed. We have answers in Scripture. We have answers in many of the Church Fathers, incidentally. But most men are not going to be able, in the first case, to formulate the response, or in the second, simply to have read, well, it's quite a lot of information, actually. It's many thousands of pages to read the Church Fathers. And so Satan is attacking us 
where he believes us to be weak. And he's right. The institutional church is very weak on these issues. And so part of what we need to do, and part of why it's important to have books like this, is we need to respond to these issues where the church doesn't just have a one-page answer. The church doesn't have, here's the Apostles' Creed, that's my response. Here's the Athanasian Creed, that's my response. We need something like that. It has not been developed yet. It has not been put forth. And unfortunately, we're a little short on truly competent theologians these days. However, that doesn't mean that we can't have an answer to these questions. It just means we don't have something that rises to the level of a creed. But we do have things like this book that will go over Christian Zionism, that will go over somewhat briefly, but still in a useful and important way, what it means to be a racialist, why that's compatible with Christianity. These are the things we need to know, because this is the field on which Satan is currently fighting. And if you're a faithful soldier, you have to be on the field where the battle is actually joined. This is something that is reflected in chapter two of the book, Christianity Yesterday and Tomorrow. He has a couple quotes from uh, Victor Craig that I want to read here because they, I think they make an important point that goes along with what some of what you just said, kind of from a different direction. But again, much of his audience is perhaps unbelievers who don't know some of these things about the church or about church history. But I also hope that a lot of believers will, will pick up the book because as we get into some of the later chapters, there's a great deal of information, some of which is so horrifying that I don't think we'll even go into much detail about it. Um, I should mention, I forgot to mention up front, families, fathers, if you're listening with kids, be sure to check the show notes before you get into the later part of this episode, just to see the details on what we get into. We didn't discuss yet how much we'll go into, but there's definitely stuff that is not child-friendly if we talk about it. Anyway, Victor Craig writes, The same revolutionary forces that undermine Europe's civilizational and racial identity have only recently succeeded in undermining its religious identity. Therefore, to condemn the church for what amounts to an 11th hour conversion to a movement that has adamantly opposed for generations is short-sighted and unfair. No student of history can argue that Christianity is somehow inherently defective in ways that weaken the race. Craig later continues, How can whites claim to be defenders of a people and of a race and yet scoff at the deepest convictions of their ancestors? How can they speak of preservation when they oppose the faith that has for so long defined and guided our race? Today's whites are the final link in the chain of faith that reaches more than a thousand years into the past. If they can throw off their ancient religion so easily, what else might they cast aside? Their language? Their culture? Their race? Should we not be suspicious of men who invoke the wisdom of their ancestors, views on blacks or immigrants, but who reject the spiritual foundation on which their ancestors built their lives, who reject what their ancestors would have said was the source and strength of all wisdom? Again, I think that's consistent, Corey, with what you just said, and this is a, an argument that we often make. It's important for us when we're sitting here in current year, looking at the hellscape of the world, you know, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, globally, whatever scope you're looking at, if you think that you can just roll back to some earlier date without all of the preconditions of that date, you're, you're kind of just doing a fi- sci-fi exercise. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in particular, when we're talking about Christians in the West, when we're talking about whites, there's no way to roll back to any period of European history that we consider glorious today without rolling back to a point where Christians were in charge and it was actually a Christian nation with Christian rulers. And we've discussed in the past the glory of Rome and the glory of Greece and how to some extent those things were true, but they also had many of the exact horrors that we see today. They had abortion and infanticide and euthanasia of the old and all sorts of horrible things that today we would reject and say, well, that that has no place in, in the West. And that's true, but that's only because the West was redefined by Christianity to the point that we consider them synonymous. So in the second chapter, he lays out a good argument that we can't get back the things that all of us 
as as white people, regardless of our religion, seek to preserve without simultaneously either preserving or returning to the faith of our fathers, because that was the genesis of the things that made Europe great. All the greatness that we had went along with us being Christian nations. There's a part where he says that, you know, if we undertake kind of like a, a political attempted a political revolution, but without Christianity, quoting Craig again, he says, he'll have established a nation without an identity and a body without a soul, which I, I think is, um, it's, in, it's important in the way that you're saying. I also find it personally encouraging thing in a way, um, because it kind of solidifies for me, you know, how how tremendous of a thing is, is my faith and how um, intrinsic it is to not just the the greatness, but, you know, even the, the survival um, of my people and how much it's something that we can all lean on for encouragement uh, in the struggle that we have before us. Indeed. And it's not unknowable. We, we, we don't have to invent something new. We just have to go back to doing the things that used to be done by the folks who in, provided inheritance that was then destroyed at some point in recent generations. But we don't need to start from scratch. We just need to go back to that which actually worked for our own people. A sort of tangent, but you mentioned the necessity of having all of the underpinnings in place if you want to go back to a particular time or achieve the equivalent of that time in the modern world. There was an experiment in the 60s. I think it, he may have run it into the 70s as well. But a man by, I can't remember his first name, but the last name of Calhoun ran an experiment involving mice. I think he may have also run the experiment with rats, but he basically built a utopia for them, what he thought was a utopia. They had food, they had shelter, they had everything they needed, but it was a thoroughly artificial environment, a very constructed environment that was not natural and it led to complete disaster for the rodent populations. They would have a boom cycle followed by a bust. There was all sorts of aggression, despite the fact that they had all the resources they needed. Basically, he was trying to create a utopia and wound up creating the mouse version of hell, which is essentially the lesson of all utopian fiction, as it were. For those who do not know, it's been mentioned previously, but utopia in the Greek means not a place. Built into the word itself is sort of a joke about the impossibility of this utopia, which is an important thing, another tangent, but it's an important matter for those on the right to remember. And this is where Christianity really serves the right particularly well in this particular way. We will never build a utopia, not in this life, because this is a fallen world. This is a sinful world. This is a world tainted by original sin. There will be no utopia in this life. That doesn't mean we can't build a better world. It doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to build a better world. That is, in fact, our duty as Christians to those who will come after us, and also, of course, our duty to God. We can make a much better world than the one we currently have, of course. And no, I'm not being an optimist or any of the various flavors of millenarian, I'm simply pointing out it is possible to build a better world than the one we currently have. We know that. Our ancestors had that for centuries prior to, well, modernism. However, we have to bear in mind that if we lose sight of the fact that we're working in a fallen world with fallen sinful beings, and we think that we can create a utopia Odds are we're going to create hell on earth. You cannot create a utopia. You can create a better life for those who come after you, and that should be our goal. And this is something that Christianity is really vitally important for any sort of political movement on the right. You have to have a conscience for your political movement, and that is what Christianity is for the actual political right. Christianity informs our ethical decisions, our moral calculus. It is our conscience. And without it, we will probably build 
a complete disaster. I'm not saying that historically we haven't had European pagan societies that were relatively successful, but as well as pointed out a number of times, you had abortion, you had infanticide, you had human sacrifice in some cases, very rare in the European context, but not zero. These were very real problems that arose in the absence of Christianity. And as we've pointed out in previous episodes, part of the reason that Europeans did so well relative to others is that we did not fall as far from our historic Christian faith. Because obviously our father, our original father of all of the European peoples, was a Christian when he stepped off the ark. Noah had taught him the Christian faith. He went ahead and transmitted that to his sons. At some point that chain was broken. But it was not broken as early or as thoroughly as in the case of the sons of Ham and many of the sons of Shem. So the sons of Japheth were loyal for longer, were true to Christianity, and we benefited from that. We also returned to Christianity more quickly, and we benefited from that as well. And so that is another point to bring up for those who think that Christianity is incompatible with a functioning European society. The most functional European society we've ever had was Christian. And it was for centuries. It is only since we've abandoned Christianity, in large part, that we've had these problems. Yes, there are other complicating factors. There's rampant Satanism, and, well, we've gone over a wealth of problems in previous episodes, and we'll go over more in future episodes. But we've lost our core. We no longer have any real moral or ethical core to our people because we abandoned Christianity. And that is the central point of really this podcast and also a central point in this book. You need Christianity because it is one of the prerequisites in order to build back the sort of society that our ancestors enjoyed and that we have lost in only the last handful of generations. You cannot restore the structure unless you restore the foundation. And the foundation of the Western world is Christianity, because the Western world is Christendom. In chapter 3, which is a short chapter on what he calls Christian Reformation, but it's really about the migration of Christianity from the Mediterranean into Northwestern Europe. It's the first argument that Giles make, and I, I refer to him by his first name just so I don't call him Corey because that would be incredibly confusing. The argument that he makes is one that it seems that he adopted from James Russell, which I I disagree with completely the way he presents it, but I'm interested, Corey, for you to chip in because I'm sure that you know more about the background of this argument. Basically, it comes down to this James Russell quote. The process by which Christianity was Germanized in its attempt to Christianize the Germanic peoples was not the result of organized Germanic resistance to Christianity or of an attempt by the Germanic peoples to transform Christianity into an acceptable form. Rather, it was primarily a consequence of the deliberate enculturation of Germanic religio-cultural attitudes within Christianity by Christian missionaries. This process of accommodation resulted in the essential transformation of Christianity from a universal religion to a Germanic and eventually European folk religion. Now, I don't know the background of that argument. Uh, interestingly, later on when in the chapter where he's discussing African and the Global South adoption of Christianity, he makes much the same argument except very critically. Uh, for me, I think that the my read on what was going on, I think it's a framing issue that I, I fundamentally have, because I think when you look at Christianity in the first few centuries where there was persecution because Christians were a minority, they were first a small minority, they were viewed as a cult, then they became a larger minority, and in some cases they became you know the overwhelming majority, yet still not a an official state religion, because all states had a state religion, and generally the, the head of the state, the head of the nation, was also a god. You know, the pinch of, of incense to Caesar was to acknowledge his godship. I think that what changed when missionaries moved into Germany and elsewhere in Europe 
was that Christianity was not migrating to different cultural contexts, but it was migrating to places where it simply became the dominant religion. And the dominant religion is always in a preferred place and should be an exclusive place in in the case of a monotheistic religion, which is almost an obscenity because there is only one God. And so the notion that, that monotheism can have different faces is itself a separate lie. But I my read on the history of Christianity moving into places like the German peoples and elsewhere in Europe was not that it was being adapted to local mores or that there was syncretism. It was simply that when the German people became Christian, Christianity became their culture. It was incorporated into their culture, as always happens. You know, it's natural that a German Christian and a French Christian, even, and an English Christian are going to behave in slightly different ways. Certainly an Irish Christian, you know, you put those four in one place and you're going to have differences in behavior and approach that isn't simply a function of the history of their denominational changes throughout time, but it's also a function of them as a race. You know, the race of Irishmen is distinct from the race of Englishmen. That's been the source of (laughs) the troubles because when the English try to dominate the Irish, the Irish don't like it, and so they fight. That is, it's part of race. It's it's part of one of the things that makes it so ludicrous to think that race isn't inextricable. Because when an Englishman becomes Christian, he's going to approach things differently than a German who becomes Christian. That's fine. It's both, those are both Christian, and I, I simply reject the minor point that doesn't really flow into the rest of the book that somehow that was syncretistic. I think it was simply that when the Germanic peoples became Christian, they were they were still Germans. So they didn't they didn't stop having German character. Christianity simply became their their worldview as well as their religion. So, Corey, I'm curious what you have to say about that theory because I'm sure it's something you've given a lot more thought in reading. He gives a sort of light touch to an argument that became popular in the academy. Really, I guess it's been probably a couple of decades ago at this point, but yeah, Russell's book was 1996, so probably maybe 30 years ago this started to crop up, and it's kind of waxed and waned over time. But the argument essentially is that Christianity started out, This I'm not making this argument for myself, please note that, this is the academic argument that has been advanced. Christianity started out as a Middle Eastern religion because they always neglect the fact that Christianity started in the garden. But they say that it started out as a Middle Eastern religion. And then from there, it moved into the Greek and Roman context, the Roman context via the Greeks, and became eventually under Constantine because he always plays this outsized role in all of these mythologies. Under Constantine, it becomes the state religion It becomes Romanized to a certain degree, which of course means Europeanized to a certain degree. And then when the Germanic tribes invade and start taking Christianity back with them, it becomes Germanized. And so the argument is that Christianity through this transmission route became a German, a Germanic European religion, whereas it had originally been a Middle Eastern religion. This is, of course, complete nonsense when taken to the degree that the Academy would like to take it. Now, the problem isn't that the argument itself is necessarily false. It's the emphasis is totally wrong. The goal of the Academy, of course, is to discredit Christianity, is to make it seem like it's this chameleon that just adapts itself as it moves through the world. And incidentally, we do see this today with those who are trying to say that, oh, well, now... Christianity has become African and Asian. It's part of the global South. It's a new thing. That's this argument for idiots. But in reality, what you have is you have Christianity becoming the core of these cultures as it goes, which really it's a restoration of the ancient faith, but it becomes the core of the culture, and the culture molds itself around that Christian core. There's nothing wrong with that. If we manage to, say, Christianize Japan, 
Japanese Christianity will not look the same as Western Christianity. Japanese Christianity, if it is Christianity in fact, will have the same tenets, because again, it's those tenets that are important. If you have some differences in the look and the way you conduct your ceremonies, that's fine. That's a cultural difference. There is no reason ceremonies need to be the same everywhere. And incidentally, I'm basically quoting the Book of Concord right there. That is one of the arguments we put forth, that you can have differences in the ceremonies due to cultural differences. And one of the examples that Luther liked to use was actually the Italians versus the Germans, which despite the fact that we're next door neighbors, two very different peoples. We're going to behave differently in all of our cultural contexts. We're going to have different ceremonies. You're going to have very different singing in a German Lutheran church versus an Italian church, whatever they happen to be. Granted, Italians almost certainly Roman Catholic. But Christianity did not become German. That's not what happened. Christianity became the core of the German culture. Now, of course, Christianity was in large part entirely compatible culturally with the Germans as it found them. Obviously not religiously, because the German tribes were pagan at the time, and so that had to be jettisoned. But the culture can remain because the culture had many of the things that are required in Christianity, that are part of the Christian religion, because again, they had not fallen as far, and they had not been apostate for as long. And so, for instance, you have Roman historians who will specifically note that marriage was held in high esteem among the German tribes. Adultery was basically unheard of. It was very severely punished, usually by death, etc. There are many arguments along these lines from the pagan historians who are noting how these various tribes behaved. And so when you have Christianity that comes in and says, thou shalt not commit adultery, well, that's perfectly in line with what the Germans already believed. Now, notably, they didn't reject Christianity. If instead of actual Christians, actual missionaries going and proclaiming actual Christianity to these tribes, you had someone proclaiming the modern conception of Christianity as propounded by the mainline so-called churches and by Rome and in large part by basically all of the organized forms of Christianity. The European tribes would have rejected it because what you have today, the modern conception of this theology, so-called, is a, is a death cult. It's a death pact. It's a suicide pact. These are not the actual tenets of Christianity. These are corruptions of them. And so you would have never been able to convert the European peoples with the false faith that is masquerading as Christianity today in the West. And the global South is another problem. It's mostly syncretism that's the problem down there. In the West, it's mostly these liberal ideas in the technical sense. But the takeaway point is that Christianity was not Germanized. I'm not saying that the book isn't worth reading. It's an interesting book. If you're the sort of person who finds this interesting, then by all means, grab the book and read it. There's plenty of other material as well, many journal articles. But the emphasis is wrong. Germany did not transform Germany in the, the grand sense here. Obviously, it was Germanic tribes at the time. Germany did not transform Christianity. Christianity became the core of Germanic culture and eventually became the core of all European culture. It is the foundation upon which the Western world is built. You cannot have the West without Christianity. And in point of fact, you cannot have Christianity without the West. As has been proven, the West is the only bastion of Christianity. It has always been the only bastion of Christianity. The only possible exception was when basically all of the sons of Noah, at this point great-great-great-grandsons, depending on where in the world, when all of these progeny of Noah had fallen away, God chose a small tribe in the Near East in order to maintain 
the Christian faith. And that was with active, pervasive, and constant intervention by God himself. That is what it was reduced to for a time. But since the coming of Christ, since the transmission of the gospel to the West, the West has been Christendom, and Christendom is the West. Without the West, you don't have the Church, and without the Church, you don't have the West. And that is fundamentally what is discussed in the third part of the book. Um, so the first three chapters cover the just kind of a brief introduction of the state of the Church. The second part of the book is about half of the book. In my opinion, I think it's really the meat of what is presented here is on the heresy of Christian Zionism. Uh, Giles gives a really good survey of the history of both premillennial and postmillennialist thought. Uh, notably, he ignores amillennialism altogether, which is kind of a bummer. As, as Lutherans, we reject the notion that there is a millennium as a thousand-year period. There is the ascension of Christ, and there's Pentecost, and then that is the millennium until almost before the return of Christ. So we are living in the millennium now. That That is what we believe. And, you know, there are variations of these various things. It's a little bit of a bummer that he wasn't familiar with it. I, I, did a, I didn't see it at all in the book, and I did a word search. All millennium doesn't appear even once, which is fine. Like, that's, again, as, as we note these things, it's not to say, oh, this is a bad book, but it's just, I think that whenever any, you're listening to anything or reading anything, you should always be critical. You know, we, we always encourage you to be critical of things that we say because we know that they will withstand scrutiny. That should be the approach that we take to everything. If, if you are absorbing things mindlessly, you're, you're basically a weapon at the hands of whoever's feeding you information. So the, the small criticisms that we have of the book are in no way a negation of the, the really good work that he's done here. I, you know, if I wanted a better book to exist, I should have written my, myself. It's it's a huge undertake, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him for producing this. So, you know, when we mention these things, please don't take it as as an indictment. Uh, he does he covers the the history of Zionism really well, and it's a, a really nice compliment to again the series that we did on the Jews, the four part series, particularly the the last two. I think that get the most into Zionism. As Corey mentioned, we've had a ton of requests recently for an episode on dispensationalism. I think we're going to have to do that. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to because it's painful. Which is just me whining like a little girl. I, I, I have decided I need to treat this podcast basically as my job at this point. And if I find a topic unpleasant, that just means it's that much more important to do it because we have a lot of people asking for that. And you know, as we're as we're recording this right now. Uh, Israel's dropping bombs on hospitals and killing hundreds of people in Gaza. That sort of violence ebbs and flows in that part of the world throughout time. One of the things that we don't want to do with, with Stone Choir episodes is to make them highly time-sensitive. I want someone to be able to come along years from now and listen to one of these episodes and not feel like they're listening to a time capsule. I hope that the things that we're discussing are are always relevant. And so that means there are some topics we avoid. So in the case of dispensationalism, it is, again, it is the, the heresy that undergirds Christian Zionism in this in this book. And so he does a really good job in a great deal of detail laying out how we got here. And it's, it's fascinating reading through part two of this book, how much of it plays directly into the headlines like this afternoon. Uh, and it's it's aggravating. That shouldn't be the case. We we should not have events in the Middle East being dictated by bad theology. But the case that he makes in the book, and the, the pivotal case that we'll also be making when we do an episode on dispensationalism, is that the heresy of Christian Zionism and the heresy of dispensationalism was specifically created in order to ensure that when this day and current year came, when Israel was going to war again with all their neighbors— that the United States would, the people of this country, would feel that we have a moral obligation to support Israel because they're our greatest ally and because God gave them that land and all that nonsense. Uh, there are a couple quotes I wanted to mention here because they undergird the, the overarching theme of the heresy of Zionism. Quote, Indeed, Zionism would most probably have remained a theological position were it not for the intervention of a handful of influential aristocratic politicians 
who came to share the theological convictions of Way, Irving, and Darby, and translated them into political reality. One such politician, the philanthropist Lord Shaftesbury, was convinced that the restoration of the Jews to Palestine was not only predicted in the Bible, but also coincided with the strategic interests of British foreign policy, a view shared by Prime Minister Lord Palmerston, as well as future Prime Ministers Lord Arthur Balfour and David Lloyd George. So I believe this quote was from the mid-1800s. It was before, incidentally, the Schofield Bible had been covered, and that's one of the things that he discusses in, in detail in a future chapter. Again, that like we try not to do topical episodes, but the the notion that Palestine being ripped away from the Palestinians who'd lived there for thousands of years and given to another people, the Genesis was part of the genesis of Christian Zionism, this heresy. And then today, people are dying because of it. Americans are going to die because of it. Right now, we have naval ships moving into place. They're going to get shot at. Soldiers and Marines are going to be on the ground in, whether it's in Gaza or elsewhere. They're going to get hurt and they're going to get killed. Never mind the civilians and the others who are already dying. I, I don't mean to imply that American lives are worth more to us than their lives are to them, but certainly the American life is worth more to me in terms of we shouldn't be going there and dying for someone else's war. And so that was the, the key reason that this heresy was invented two centuries ago, was to make the wars in the, the troop movements that we're seeing today even possible. That's, that's a big deal. And that's why this part of the book is so vitally important, because if you don't understand where this stuff came from and how pervasive it became in Western culture, particularly American and British culture, there's no way to understand what's happening today. One thing that I, I think really kind of suggests itself as you read that particular uh, part that you read, um, where he's talking about uh, Lord Shaftesbury's view that the restoration of the Jews to Palestine not was not only predicting the Bible, but also coincided with the strategic interests of British foreign policy. I, I think my immediate thought was, you know how how absolutely clear it is in hindsight that there is no truth to that idea at all that um you know the interests of the uh, jewish state in any way coincided uh with the interests of the british empire the whole the the formation of you know as, as we're all well aware of the, the coming to existence of the state of israel after world war ii um and the whole process there that came about by the same process that led that destroyed the British Empire, um, you know their uh, insistence on uh, fighting a world war uh, with uh, Germany, um, and he goes into that argument, uh, kind of the same type of argument, uh, not specifically on that point, but just generally making the point that uh, you know the idea that philo-Semitism uh, and uh, blessing the physical people of Israel, the physical Jews, is in any way a blessing to the nation that does it is just completely not borne out by history. Um, but that's that was just something that really stood out to me while, while reading that. Uh, so I'm happy that you uh, kind of picked up on that specific passage. You can say that you're avoiding the dispensationalism issue, and that's entirely understandable. I've read a fair amount of it, and it's not exactly the most enjoyable slog, but at the same time, if you're reading about dispensationalism, it is a valid excuse to put off reading Palamas, which is in fact worse, although we will still eventually <laughs> get around to the episode on Eastern Orthodoxy, and I do have the, the full translation of his major work now instead of just the... It's really not a summary, it's still something like half to two-thirds of the work but I have the definitive edition now by a Greek Orthodox priest, so that particular objection that has been voiced by some will no longer be valid when we get around to that episode. But it is a very interesting point that, in hindsight, obviously, the British decisions in and during World War II, leading up to it, during it, and after it, regarding what is today known as the State of Israel did not coincide with British interests insofar as the British nation is concerned. 
Now, it certainly helped line the pockets of many British politicians and businessmen, but it certainly destroyed the British Empire, and ultimately, as we see today, it destroyed the British nation. Perhaps not yet beyond the point of salvage, we can certainly hope and pray for that, but things are not looking good for the United Kingdom, certainly. Because, well, quite frankly, Israel has flooded Europe with so-called refugees. It is biological warfare against the European nations, whom the Jews view as their mortal enemies, always have and always will. And so we, in sort of a larger sense here in the West, largely, yes, the British and the Americans, basically established our centuries-old enemy in a state of their own and then have funded them to the tune of, quite frankly, at this point, probably an uncountable amount of money. And we see the consequences of that today. You mentioned that you hope that the episodes aren't topical in the sense of not standing the test of time because of things that are no longer relevant, were relevant only in the moment. In point of fact, I do hope that these episodes, certain ones, become entirely topical because I would very much like to see Israel no longer be an issue at some point. So hopefully someone listening 50 years in the future will have to go and look at a history book for that one. So part of the dispensational heresy is the Schofield Reference Bible. I think pretty much everyone who's listening has probably heard about it before. This was a study Bible that was published in 1909. The author of this book does a really good job going into the history of that man, <laughs> or the absence of history of that man, uh, who called himself a doctor and called himself a number of other things, despite there being literally no evidence of any of them. As best we can tell, he was a complete fraud and charlatan at every step. He was an absolute nobody scumbag grifter, who somehow became connected with the highest echelons of Western society on both sides of the Atlantic. And this translated directly into him publishing, so-called, this Bible. I think it was Oxford Press that did it, which was, again, completely out of the blue. It was the publisher, the press that produced it. I don't think they'd done a Bible, at least in quite some time. It was it was far outside of their purview. And so, as, as he makes the case, all these little facts on the ground seemingly out of nowhere, make no sense. But looking back in time, it, they do make sense if you believe that the supernatural acts to cause things, and if you believe that there are men who conspire to achieve things in time, which I would hope all of us do, as, you know, as we established in the beginning of the, the Greatest Lie episode, we talked about uh, COVID. We talked about the fact that we were all lied to about the origins of the disease, about the nature of the injections. Conspiracies actually happen. People in dark rooms make plans to hurt people, and then they put them into practice, and they often succeed. They sometimes fail. Plans don't always work, but they try. And as we've said in the past, one of the chief blind spots that Christians in particular have is we are governed by a belief that I would never do that, therefore no one would ever do that, which is, is a pernicious lie. And so after World War I, I'm going to read a quote here now. After World War I, the Schofield Reference Bible flew off the rack, exceeding two million copies by the end of World War II. Hence the pointless carnage of the World Wars literally sold the Schofield Bible and its apocalyptic pro-Israel message. The 1948 creation of the State of Israel also made Schofield's premillennialism seem prophetic. So basically, what he did with annotations and footnotes, they were very selective you know, as he went through the text of the Bible. It was the, 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 only, the only additions that were made, the only changes that were made, were done with the specific intent of laying the groundwork for the mandate of Palestine to become what we now know as the state of Israel. Uh, here's another quote. Schofield wisely chose not to change the text of the King James edition. Instead, he added hundreds of easy-to-read footnotes at the bottom of about half of the pages. 
and as the Old English grammar of the King James becomes increasingly difficult for progressive generations of readers, students became increasingly dependent on the modern language footnotes. That's entirely true, and I, I find this particular comment to be pretty hilarious because in the preface, the very first words of this entire book by Giles, he specifically says that the King James is essentially the only true Bible, that all the others have basically been corrupted, and it's the only one anyone should use, and that the corruptions in other translations are the fault of the problems that we have in the church today. There are definitely bad translations, but we actually spent about half of last week's episode, or two weeks ago now, because we had a brief hiatus. Two weeks ago, when we did the episode on their listener mail, we talked about choosing Bibles, and I specifically made the point that the King James is singularly unsuitable for a modern Bible, precisely for the reason he mentions here. Because the grammar was increasingly difficult, people relied on the footnotes. So the very thing that he holds up is a necessity for the preservation of the word, in fact, is its greatest weakness. As we said in that episode, it's a beautiful book. It is the Bible, but it's archaic language to the point that people don't know what they're reading. And that's borne out by history. It's borne out in modern denominations today. The the more adamantly a denomination says, we are King James only, nothing else is suitable, I can pretty much guarantee that overwhelmingly they're going to be dispensationalist and they're going to have a lot of other really bad doctrine too. At some point, the two cannot be ignored as going together. So it's a minor point that he made, and I don't mean to pick on him, but it's just, it's important to recognize that if you can't understand the Bible, what are you going to do? You're going to go to someone who can help you, and that's precisely what Schofield and his financial backers exploited. They put these footnotes in, and the footnotes didn't have anything to do with Scripture. Again, the, what he inserted into the text was specifically around creating a moral imperative for Christians to recreate basically the Third Temple. The idea is that, and, and he gets into in some of the later chapters, forget the Jesus stuff. We need Israel to be in the land of Israel because that's what God promised to Abraham. And we as Christians must do everything we can to give them back everything that was taken in AD 70. It's blasphemous on its face. It, it's predicated on false doctrine. And it's also fundamentally destructive to nations. See, this is this is part of the reason that we need Christian voices in these discussions doing a good job with the Christian stuff, because geopolitics hinges on, <laughs> today, it hinges on false doctrine that was introduced over a century ago. And it, it, Schofield didn't come up with this stuff. He, he cribbed it from Darby and others, but it was inserted into Western culture in a way that we're stuck with today. And those footnotes in the annotations that he made are today cited as doctrine by many people. And the end result is the creation of the state of Israel in two carrier battle groups off the shore of Gaza today, ready for us to go to war and die for a conflict that has nothing to do with us. And we see the long coat tails of Schofield in many modern study Bibles. This is not something where someone needs to have Schofield in order to be influenced and really infected by these notes. Because there's Ryrie, which is an updating of the Schofield. There's the MacArthur Study Bible, which in large part is the Schofield reworked. Yes, there are many additional notes, but Schofield still comes through. And this is the case for really anything produced by those who've attended any of the various institutions that are largely dispensationalist. One of the biggest offenders would be Dallas Theological Seminary, but the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary is another major offender when it comes to promulgating and pushing dispensationalist heresy. So this is very much a live issue. This is not something that has faded into the background. And I had the, the same reaction when I saw that particular comment in light of the preface. And that was the one, the biggest problem I had with, I guess we could say really this edition, because you can go back through and swap out all of the citations to scripture for a different translation. That's fine. I would love to see a version of this that had, say, the ESV or the NASB or any of a number of translations other than the King James. 
Now, I recognize there are copyright issues, but that's a separate matter. It would be more accessible to the reader if a modern translation of scripture were used. And that's exactly what is admitted in that chapter. The King James is just not accessible to people anymore, as we went over at length in the previous episode. I do find it funny, though, that it's always the King James, which obviously 1611, although it's never the 1611 because they always use the updated version. So apparently updating it's fine as long as you're still calling it the King James, because no one is using the original version with the old spelling in the Apocrypha. You never see that. Okay, that's not entirely true. I did meet one man in a coffee shop who absolutely insisted that the original spelling was somehow also important, and he had it on him at the time. So I've, had, I've encountered that once in my life. But I do find it funny that you don't have the original version of the King James being the one they always argue you have to use. And for some reason, it's the King James and not the Tyndale. You have the Tyndale that came before the King James in, well, it's an older English and it's even more difficult to read. But the point is, the language has changed, so you need to have a version you can read. I do also find it worth noting that the Tyndale Bible in English and the Luther Bible, obviously, in German, essentially the exact same years for the initial and full versions, 1522 and 1534, 1535. And to be clear, that critique of of the author in no way changes any of his conclusions. Like like Corey said, you could you could swap out any other version of the Bible, and the theology would the arguments would work just as well. In fact, one of the first citations from the King James that he uses, I struggled with like what I what what does that mean? I'm literate, I'm not dumb, and yet I if I'm struggling struggling with something, I guarantee that other people are. And guys who tell me, oh, you, you just need experience with it, well. You think that because you think it's a magic Bible language. And I'm sorry, I know that there are guys that get really adamant about this, but, you know, right in the text of this book, on one hand, he says, King James is the only thing. And on the other, he says, it's causing problems. And everyone was going to the footnotes. The footnotes wouldn't have worked if not for the confusing language. There's also the issue of, if you're saying that you have to spend time with this in order to know how to read it, you're really admitting what you're doing. You're learning another language. Yes, you're learning a equivalent of, say, a dialect, sort of. You're learning a form of English. But if you're saying that you have to spend time with this to learn it, go ahead and learn Greek. Just read the untranslated New Testament and the Septuagint, then. The problem is you see men who are advocating King James only, and they don't put in the time to actually learn the Greek. I'm not saying you have to learn Greek to know scripture, but I am saying if you're going to absolutely insist that, oh, you have to know this, that, and the other in order to understand scripture, learn the original language. Put in the effort and do that. Don't tell me that I have to read English from 400 years ago. Because the men who were translating it were looking at the Greek when they translated it. So they were relying on the Greek. So if you want to insist that you absolutely must read in this particular version, go ahead and learn the Greek. Then we can have a discussion about whether you find something in the Greek that doesn't come through in, say, the English Standard Version or the NASB, because then we can actually have a real conversation about translation choices. Otherwise, it's really just turning the King James into an idol, which is not what Scripture is meant to be. I'm not saying, you know, oh, Biblicism is dangerous and you can't rely too much on scripture. No, that's not the point. The issue is when you turn one particular translation into the Bible. That's not how the Word of God works. That's not how God has told us it works. Because look at the history. God caused the original Hebrew of the Old Testament, and yes, Aramaic in certain places, to be translated into Greek. God caused that to happen. And then, when he came to earth, he cited the Greek. So God gave his stamp of approval to translation. So using a translation of scripture is entirely fine. As we keep telling people, read the scriptures, one, in the Bible you actually have, so you actually read, and two, in a language you actually understand. With the one caveat being, 
if you want to learn a foreign language, reading scripture is a great way to do that. There's another long quote from this chapter that I want to read. I think it's important to note that, you know, this was written, I think, in 2019, 2020, roughly. And yet this describes current circumstances almost to a T. A lot of the same names are in this as we're seeing in the news today. As Corey said, that shouldn't be. We, we shouldn't be hearing about this stuff. But the heresy of Christian Zionism is what has produced the geopolitical situation we have. Quote, Falwell was the founder of Liberty University and operated a popular television ministry. In 1979, Falwell founded the Moral Majority, a major organization in the American religious right. Israel, the state of Israel, provided Falwell with a personal Learjet, and in 1980, he became the first Gentile to be awarded the Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky Medal for Zionist Excellence by Prime Minister Begin. When Israel bombed Iraq in 1981, Begin called Falwell before Reagan to explain to the Christian public the reasons for the bombing. Falwell regularly defended and minimized Israeli atrocities, and in 1985 pledged to the Rabbinical Assembly in Miami to mobilize 70 million conservative Christians for Israel and against anti-Semitism. Continuing the pattern, in 1998, then and current Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with Falwell before President Clinton, and in 2000, Falwell revived the Moral Majority as People of Faith 2000, a pro-Israel movement to reclaim America as one nation under God. Sizer writes that Falwell succeeded probably better than any other American Christian leader in ensuring his followers recognize that their Christian duty to God involves providing unconditional support for the state of Israel. Oh boy howdy. Doesn't that sound like a lot of people on Twitter and pretty much everywhere else right now? When you see news from the Middle East, this is the first thing that many people who call themselves Christians will say, we must support Israel. Those who bless Israel will be blessed. That's what God promised, and it's eternal, and blah, blah, blah. He goes into several chapters detailing specifically how utterly blasphemous and nonsensical that is. But Again, when this was created and then passed through time, it it has reshaped our world physically. It's reshaped the physical world. This isn't just about ideas. This isn't just footnotes and theories and theology. This is life and death. And again, part of the reason it's important for it to be discussed in the political sphere, even among unbelievers, is to explain it's not the no true Scotsman fallacy for us to say that dispensationalism is evil. It is per se evil, because it's not simply that these people are getting a few things wrong. There are those, you know, maybe they, they've fallen for the dispensationalist lies, but they're not particularly invested in them. Those people are in error. They're, they're Christians who've made a mistake. The problem is that when push comes to shove, the vast majority of radical adherence to dispensationalism, which is most of them, there's, there are not many lightweight dispensationalists. If this is your bag, you're all the way. Those people will throw God out the window to support the terrorist state of Israel. And they think it is more important. They think it is more important to do these things than to have Jesus. And they were told by false teachers that Jesus said that's okay. It's interesting, as he details in the book, the history of this infiltration of these things, Every tale televangelist you've ever heard, every name you would recognize as a grifter, as someone who is a thief and a liar and a blasphemer, they're all in there. They were all paid by the state of Israel to tell the lies that they told on TV. It was, it was a system. They became fabulously wealthy serving Satan because it's one of the promises that Satan made to Jesus. I'll give you everything. Just serve me. Well, Jesus said no. But these televangelists, like, that's a great deal. I love a jet. I'd like a free jet. Wouldn't that be nice? These guys will happily sell out because they can convince themselves, well, no, it's okay. And so whether they are knowingly complicit in these lies, which I think virtually all of them are, I think they all are, whether or not they were knowingly complicit initially, they all have seared their conscience to the point that they cannot possibly be Christian when they continue to perpetuate these things. But it's not just theology. It's not just a theological fight, and I think that's an overarching theme of the book and of Stone Choir. This stuff that we're talking about, it's not simply 
an interdenominational squabble over who's reading the Bible better. When these ideas are taken into the real world, civilizations rise or fall as a result. That makes it the most important thing that we can be talking about right now. As Corey alluded to earlier, Satan's not coming after justification. He's not coming after the nature, two natures of Christ or any of the other things that were past battles. He's coming after physical reality. He's coming after sex. He's coming after race. He's coming after nations and borders and saying none of those things exist. And virtually every church is going along with it. And the heresy of Christian Zionism was in many cases the solvent that made that possible. See, they were preaching against so-called anti-Semitism long before the anti-racism screed got fired up in churches. That's not a coincidence. The only way that we have current year problems in our schools and our workplaces is traced directly back to this original invention. If you have people who are so evil that they're napalm, they're using the equivalent of napalm, that's effectively what white phosphorus is. It's just that it's something that you can get away with because there's a legitimate battlefield use for it. It's not how they use it. When they use that stuff against civilians, when they bomb hospitals, as they just did tonight, the dispensationalist is going to say, well, we got to bless Israel. You know, the, those, those Hamas people, those Muslims, they were the bad guys. And to be clear, I don't think the Muslims are the good guys religiously. It's not that Jews and Muslims, one has a better religion, one has a worse religion, because we know that they both worship Satan. That's what Scripture says. They, they don't worship Allah and Yahweh. They worship Satan because they don't worship Christ. They reject Christ as their religious identity. So when we talk about this, it's not picking a side in that fight. It's simply saying the evil that is being done is not being done. Hey, it's their problem. It's their fight. If they want to be evil to each other, it's none of our business. But when we look at what's happening, it's clear that the invention of Christian Zionism, so-called, was necessary for them to be able to get away with it. If any other country on the planet were doing what they're doing right now, we would have intervened to stop them. We would have bombed them to prevent it. And again, like, you know, we, we try not to make this timely, but frankly, you could listen to this on any random day in any random year and have a pretty decent chance that it would still actually be ripped from the headlines because this crap is always going on. And it's going on because this doctrine was permitted among Christians and it eventually replaced Christianity itself. I think one of the only things you really need to highlight how wicked dispensationalism is, Christian Zionism is, is 1 Timothy 5.8, a verse that we have used a number of times previously. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And if you look at those who say that they support the nation of Israel, in quotes, they will, and they are, in fact, quite happy to support Israel above and before their own. And this verse is very clear. That makes them apostate. You have, particularly among the older generation, but some in the younger generations as well, notably significantly decreasing, which is good news, but you have many who are willing to send their sons, their grandsons, over to die for Israel in a war in which we have no interest, which will not benefit us in any way, shape, or form, which does not involve us, unless, of course, Israel decides to use the Samson option, but that is a separate matter. If they are willing to send their own flesh and blood, their own children, to die for some foreign people, they're worse than an unbeliever. That's what Scripture calls them. We cannot call the people who hold to these heresies Christian. Does that mean they are all damned? No, of course not. Lutherans have the perfect answer for this one. We call it felicitous inconsistency. We've mentioned this before. It may be that these men publicly profess one thing, but when it comes right down to it, they still trust in Christ. They still have faith. They still believe there is only one way to the Father. And certainly we hope that for 
Some of them, at least. Perhaps most of them. God, of course, hopes that all will be saved, and we agree with that. However, we recognize the evil of these men, and we recognize that many of them are hardened. Their consciences are seared. They have chosen wickedness. They have chosen evil. They are not Christians. And that is simply what Scripture says of them. We don't get to debate whether or not these men are Christians. If Scripture says they are not, then they are not. Even if in their heart of hearts, where we cannot look, God alone can look, they happen still to be Christians, we have to deal with them according to what they do outwardly, because we can only look on the outward behavior. We can see what they say, we can see what they do. We have to judge according to those things, and we went over what it means to judge or judge not in a previous episode, conveniently entitled Judge Not, not in parentheses. But we have to deal with these men as they are, as we can see them, according to their deeds, according to their words. And according to their deeds and their words, they are apostate, they are outside the faith, because they do not provide for their relatives, they have abandoned their households, they have abandoned their own, for the sake of foreigners, and not just for the sake of foreigners, but for the sake of particularly wicked and vile pagans in the encompassing sense of pagan, which simply means not Christian. It would be one thing if they were advocating that we have to interfere to protect Christians somewhere. And there have been opportunities for that recently. There have been many opportunities for that historically, to defend persecuted Christians around the world. They aren't advocating for that. They're advocating that we go and shed our blood and expend our treasure for those who every single day, multiple times a day, deliberately blaspheme God and curse Christians. There is absolutely no way we can call that Christian. And the details of those prayers are presented in one of the later chapters. In chapter 5 on the theology of Christian Zionism, uh, the author does a really good job examining a number of the Zionist proof texts that have historically been deployed to basically get us to where we are today. I want to read a couple snippets here. For example, Carlson argues that the 1967 New Schofield Reference Bible deifies the state of Israel. One newly inserted footnote reads, For a nation to commit the sin of anti-Semitism brings inevitable judgment. That's a footnote to Genesis 12.3. These words, which might as well have been written by Theodore Herzl or Ariel Sharon, are found in the Bible that is followed by millions of American churchgoers and students and is used by their leaders as a source for their preaching and teaching. Carlson explains that Oxford is hereby made antipathy toward the state of Israel a sin. Well, isn't that exactly what Corey and I are accused of? The sin of anti-Semitism? That didn't come from Scripture. It it, in large part, it came from the Schofield update in 1967. These moving pieces, one of the reasons that we focus on the genealogy of ideas, is when you start looking at where this sin came from, not only don't you find the scripture, but you will find it in many cases within living memory. As a Christian, that should terrify you. That is literally a new religion being hot-swapped for our own. It's happening on the fly. It's like swapping organs in someone while they're alive. You put them on heart-lung bypass, and you just chop something out, and you slap something in. That's what's being done to Christianity by this stuff. So the sins that have been made up in the 20th century that men like us are accused of are literally created for the purpose of achieving some of the other evils that he goes into this book. We're, we're getting along. We're kind of close to two hours at this point. I can tell you, I mentioned earlier, there are a couple chapters I, I only skimmed them because I was aware of some of the material, and we'll, we'll get into some of that, what, what that was, but the depths of the evil that are downstream from these things that we're talking about here, I, we're not even going to talk about it. I, I, I don't want to put it in your ears. I, I commend the book to folks. If you buy it, there are some chapters that you may choose to skip. You may, you may get a few pages in, and I can't take any more of this. And it's not that the author is doing anything bad. He's just unflinchingly reporting as a decent historian, as a good historian, here are the facts. And the facts are 
they're unspeakable. I it's it's an overused term, but I <laughs> we're not going to speak them on this podcast because I don't want to do that to your ears. You can go opt into it and see on the page and decide if you want to be subjected to it. Another quote, by blessing the state of Israel, Christian Zionists believe that, as Schofield said, Gentiles today are thereby blessed in association with the state of Israel. They frequently misapply God's promise to Abraham, that I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, this is a shocking and blasphemous misapplication of that passage, because when Abraham is going to be used to bless all the families of the earth, that's talking about Jesus. And I think that's a seminal point that cannot be missed when we're looking at dispensationalism and Zionism. They replace Jesus in Scripture with the modern nation-state of Israel. Just as the Holocaust replaced the crucifixion, and just as Hitler replaced Satan, you have these wholesale swaps of the fundamental elements of Christian doctrine, not small stuff, where we're not talking peripheral issues here. They literally remove Jesus from the explanation for this passage and insert a country, a modern synthetic country of wicked, evil people. It's a pedophile capital of the world. It's the homosexual capital of the world. It's the transsexual capital of the world. It, it's Satan's throne on earth today. And when these people say we must bless them at all costs, all costs is us. As Corey said in reference to 1 Timothy, that's talking about us and our children, our posterity. Let them die so that Israel might live. Why? Because of the promised Abraham. That, that's it's, it's demonic. I, I, I'm, I'm almost at a loss for words. And yet this is, the, this is the essence of how Zionism works. There's bait and switch. There's a removal of Christianity in terms that sound bible This is the Jesus dust. And then what do you do? You start doing weak, wicked things and you say you're doing it in the name of God. And then you're off to the races. Because if you're doing wicked things in the name of God, you got to do them as hard as you can. That's where we're at today. The Bible that was corrupted by Schofield and the false preaching that comes from the heresy of Christian Zionism is one of the things that undergirds all of it. And necessary to those false beliefs, again, is racism and anti-Semitism. None of this works without those new sins. I think this is this whole discussion is a very good illustration of just how all this stuff is really tied together. And again, from uh, kind of my own background, you know, I, I can attest that there's, uh, again, there's plenty of conservative Christians who would take issue with uh, one thing here or, or one thing there, you know, like they, they don't like uh, um, transsexualism or maybe they're even uncomfortable with anti-whiteness, but they would really, really balk at at understanding how all of these things are, are very intrinsically connected to another and uh, how... Uh, like you both were, were saying, and I especially liked what um, Corey was saying from uh, uh, the book of Timothy, how, um, you know, this leads to uh, the sacrifice of your own family members and your own children on this uh, false uh, altar, this false idol of egalitarianism and anti-racism and anti-Semitism. Um, and I'm not going to go into it because I, I, I I think I've p picked up on that um, from what you're saying, Will, but there's a chapter in the book as one of the uh, ones that I also found difficult to read uh, that uh, talks about uh, instances of in, in recent history in the past like decade or so of, you know, where you had uh, uh, people murdered by refugees or something like that. And, and the response by their own family members was um, not even to, in some cases to, you know, to say we're forgiving, we just want to move on. But in some cases they even go, go further than that. And they use it as they use the, the death of their own family members as an opportunity to attack their race even further. So it's just, it's, it, it is really evil and it's really amazing how, how in, incredible this this change to again what is kind of the uh, cultural phenomenon of Christianity. How amazing that that change has been when you kind of look back like this book does, and you uh, look at that journey and how it's taken place. That's a good point. That's actually continued in the next chapter, which is on the the myth of Judeo Christianity. Talking, talking about the evolution of these things. This is just a great quote, and I. I'd never heard it before, but it makes such perfect sense. 
Thorpe points to noontime on December 22nd, 1952, as the precise day, nay, the precise hour, the term Judeo-Christian tradition achieved its vaunted victory over the term Christian tradition. President-elect Dwight Eisenhower declared that the American Republic is founded in a deeply felt religious faith, and I don't care what it is. With us, of course, it is the Judeo-Christian concept, but it must be a religion that teaches all men are created equal. In one fell swoop, Eisenhower reconfigured the American founding to be Judeo-Christian, an unprecedented and ahistorical superimposition. Our Latter-day Saint Martin Luther King Jr., who shares with Jesus Christ the honor of a federal holiday for his birthday, utilized Judeo-Christian as a way of grafting historical logic onto the Black Power movement. By the 1980s, the appellation of a Judeo-Christian heritage, having begun its life as a slogan of Jewish revolutionaries, had achieved mainstream status, such that it became a signature expression particularly among the religious right. And the term Judeo-Christian is used even in our seminaries by who are supposed to be the good guys, you know, the, the conservative, the really solid confessional Lutheran seminary professors, say Judeo-Christian, and I think there's nothing wrong with it. It's something we got into in one of the episodes on the Jews, the four-part series. It's part of the Marcionite heresy that the Old Testament is the Jewish book, and the New Testament is the Christian book. And when you do that, suddenly you have two gods, too. You have the God of the Old Testament, whom they often refer to, and then you have the God of the New Testament. And we can see and touch and hear Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So he's a God in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, there was this other God who was mean, and he killed a lot of people, and he had these harsh rules. But then the new God showed up and fixed it all, and made us all loving. That's what we're told. You know, not in so many words in some cases, but when you say Judeo-Christian, that's what you're saying. You're saying, I buy into that, that there is one period for them and there's another period for us. Well, that's basically just baby dispensationalism, which is not the case. As we laid out in one of those episodes, Noah, Adam, these men were not Jews. Abraham, not a Jew. They were Christians, and they were not ethnically Jewish. It's complete nonsense. It's utterly ahistorical. Jews lasted in Scripture for 2,000 years, from about 2,000 BC to the birth of Christ. And then what continued there was a rapid conversion of some of the Jews, and it's important when we're discussing them, as we, as we did in those episodes, many of the Jews of that day converted to Christianity. Much of the early church had been Jews, Jews by race and Jews by religion. The reason that they converted was that it wasn't really a conversion. It was, they were Christians, and when Christ showed up, when the Messiah showed up, like, yep, there he is, the Messiah who was prophesied was delivered to us. That is what happened, and that's what they believed. So, you know, Paul had to be converted because he was murderous. Mary didn't have to be converted. When the angel appeared to her and announced that she would be with child, she wasn't converted to a Christian. She's like, I believe you, God. It was the same faith one minute before is one minute after. She was a Christian the entire time. The necessity of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus was because he was a Pharisee. He was what rapidly became Talmudic Judaism, which is something that's discussed in a, an upcoming chapter. We're not going to get into the details of it, but the Talmud is an absolutely wicked, perverse book. And when King Louis burned as many as he could get his hand on in the Disputation of Paris, that was a service to God. The rest of them should be burned as well. That would be appropriate for Christians Christian states to do. I'm not saying individuals should be stealing them, but those books should be burnt. They're absolutely wicked. And there are a bunch of quotes in the later chapter discussing that just make abundantly clear. You know, again, it's he the author does a really good job of just laying out facts, you know, just as we try to do on Stone Quarry. Like, here you go, one fact after another. We're not going to delve into it too much because we're we're getting long on time. But when you present those things, a lot of what's presented, particularly in the later chapters on on the Talmud, it's it's vile. It's absolutely wicked. It goes into the lies and the blasphemies that every Jew is taught, every Jew to this day, because after the destruction of the temple, they codified the beliefs of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who rejected Christ. And some of them converted, you know, at least some of the Pharisees converted. Those who didn't 
accept Christ as their Savior, produced a new religion. And so the Judeo and Judeo-Christian, it's effectively saying Satan-O-Christian, this satanic religion that emerged from the ashes of the destruction of the Second Temple among these absolutely apostate, demonic people whom Christ called the sons of Satan. And today, consciences are bound. If you don't say Judeo-Christian, there's something wrong with you. Because, well, we have to recognize our elder brothers in the faith. Well, I recognize them to the extent that Scripture does, but I also recognize that the greater punishment is upon them because their inheritance they despise. We were grafted into the branch of Israel by God's grace, which makes us Israel, and is a gift, just as everyone who receives faith is receiving it as a gift. That's basic Christian theology. And yet, if you say what Scripture says about the Jews today, you're literally called anti-Semitic. There are laws being passed around the country right now. It's already happened in Florida. If you say what Scripture says about the Jews, the, theologically, you will face prison time. That's on this. That's on our soil. And it shouldn't be any surprise, because again, all these things are in motion. All these theological quibbles quickly turn to policy, and they turn to death and destruction and despair, because Satan is running the board. So I'm really thankful that he laid out the some of the details of that myth. It's something we've covered as well. But again, I think it's part of what makes this book a really good complement to Stone Choir, particularly if you want to introduce some of these subjects to somebody who maybe isn't going to listen to a podcast or you think it might be too much. There are things in this book that will be shocking. Like you said, they go further than we want to discuss out loud simply for the sake of not giving people nightmares. But that's the level of detailed evil we're talking about. And it's inextricable. As he, as he makes the case in the historical, in the next chapter on historical Christianity on Judaism, there's just a short chapter, but he quotes Chrysostom and Luther saying the same things that we say, that these are bad people. They're enemies of God. That's what God says. And as Christians, we should be able to say that without any fear or doubt. In fact, we're obligated to. You know, if if telling the truth is out of season, and if itching ears want to hear something else, the Christian is still under an obligation to God Almighty to say what Scripture says. In fact, that's when it's the most important time to say it. If these things didn't matter, if no one cared, if they weren't getting people upset, sure, you could talk about other things, because there'd be something else that would be upsetting people in Scripture. But today, these passages, these are the things that will inspire such anger and hatred that people will try to physically harm you. On the Talmud note, I have been asked a number of times recently for readings or book recommendations related to the Talmud. I will include one in the show notes. It is a book by Peter Schaefer, who is a Jewish professor, but it is a book on the passages, many of the passages, not all of them, dealing with Christ in the Talmud. It is, quite frankly, an important book for Christians to read, or at least get a summary of what is covered. Eventually, we will get around to an episode on the Talmud proper. I will not promise when that will be. That's going to be in the distant future. We have many other things on the list to get through first. However, Schaefer's book does a good job of that, and it also touches to some degree on the traditional Jewish prayers that curse Christians. I've answered that other places as well. Perhaps I'll do a write-up on that at some point. But I want to be clear about the topics in this book that we are reviewing today, discussing today, that will make some of you uncomfortable. We're not trying to hide what they are. We're not playing coy. It's dealing with sex crimes and the reality of mass immigration, so-called really invasion of the West by the third world. The reality on the ground of what that means for largely women and children, but also, in fact, some men. I may be somewhat biased, but I would say that the the treatment in this book is not unduly detailed. It is not unwarrantedly explicit. I think he strikes a fairly good balance when it comes to that describing the accounts, but not going into, like I said, not undue detail. But I've also read some rather horrible fact patterns for various legal cases in the past. So 
I may be a little biased on that. I do think that he does strike a good balance, though, and I, I think Woe would probably agree with me on that. Still unpleasant to read, of course, but it is the reality of the situation, and particularly for the male listeners, and that would be the majority of our audience, you are not given the luxury of ignoring reality, particularly when it is staring us in the face at every juncture, as it is today. What is covered in those chapters will make you uncomfortable, will make you angry, and it should. And that's a good thing, because that is the proper Christian response. That is the proper response for a Christian man. It should drive us to want to change these things. It is an indictment of our forebears that despite having this knowledge, despite seeing what is happening, they did nothing. We do not want to share in their wickedness by also failing to address these issues. And so it is important to understand the issues, to know what they are, to know what is happening, so that we can have a proper response to them. Yeah, I agree completely. When I when I said I skipped over the stuff, I was already familiar with it. I didn't need a refresher. Many of our listeners probably don't know. Uh, in chapter 8, it goes into the Talmud specifically, talks about the Talmud's hatred for Scripture, talks about how it justifies violence and murder against Gentiles. That's everyone else. And then in chapter 9, it goes into the specific manners in which they believe they are permitted to harm us. And like I said, I, Corey, I completely agree with what you said about the the degree of, of detail that's given. It's citations. He, he's not just making stuff up. He's, he's giving quotes and citations from real-world events over and over and over again. And it doesn't belabor the point. It's necessary to reinforce that it's not just, oh, there was one bad guy. This is their religion. The religion of bombing hospitals and starving children is their religion. That's what they do. And when they're doing it in current year, in current moment, they're saying those people deserve it as they're doing it. That's their religion. They're being honest. They're being completely honest about whom they serve, except for calling him God. They serve Satan. But you can tell by their actions whom they actually serve. Chapter 9, the title is Case Studies in Jewish Hostility, Degeneracy, Filth, and Pornography. And he omitted the second half of the of that chapter from the, the header, but the second half of it is specifically about the sacrifice of children by Jews, murdered murdering Christian children, exsanguinating them, and using white children's blood for their magic rituals. Now, I think that probably most people listening don't know anything about that. You might know the term blood libel, but you you know libel obviously it's false well the one of the great things about about that chapter in this book is that he makes extensive citations from a scholarly work by a, a work called blood passover it was published in 2007 by a jew named ariel toaf the son of the former chief rabbi of rome so this is a jew who's did an excellent incredibly in-depth historical examination of the entire history of Jews murdering Christian children and stealing their blood and using them for their magic rituals. Going back to the beginning of the first millennium, I think some of the earlier accounts were from like 400 AD, and it gives great detail in each of them. And again, like I skipped some because I, I didn't know some of those details, but I don't, I don't need further convincing of just how demonic these people are. Some of you probably do. And that's one of the valuable things about this particular chapter is that the first part of it is, is talking about how they have used the liberalization of sexuality and sexualization of mass culture, which they, of course, control, to act as a solvent against the church, against the family, and against civilization itself. And again, it's a case where he goes into in significant and necessary depth on the excitement that Jews have as they're doing these things. Pornography is entirely Jewish. The destruction of the laws against the dissemination of pornography, also entirely Jewish. It was Jewish lawyers with Jewish plaintiffs or Jewish defendants in most cases because they're being prosecuted for committing crimes against America. And then Jewish judges would say, no, it's okay, we have the Bill of Rights, and so you're allowed to do this horrible stuff. 
this is the enemy that the West faces. Yeah, I think that's why, that's why I think the, the center half of this book is the most vital part of it, because it lays out in detail, in documented detail. Like, again, this isn't just the author extemporaneously spouting off about this stuff. He does a good job as a historian citing other historians who've delved into these things, like just laying it all out. When you look at the totality of the evidence that he presents, as Corey said, you're going to be angry. It made me viscerally angry to read this. It was a perfect hatred because the wickedness that is being done to us, again, as I said earlier, and we've said in other episodes, we as Christians, or even as non-Christians who are just decent Europeans, would not act in these ways. Because even those Europeans who have abandoned the faith, because their families typically abandon the faith, still have the ambient morality of Christendom informing the culture that until recently surrounded us. And so the idea of harvesting organs from people while they're still alive because they're not Jews, we would never do that to someone. Like, he's not white, just take his organs, it's fine. You know, don't, don't, don't use anesthesia either because that's going to mess up the organ. You got to do it while they're fully awake, cut their heart out. We have a Jew who needs it. There are accounts of that sort of thing in the book, and they're historic accounts. They're real accounts. This stuff actually happens. And I think one of the important parts is you read through some of the chapters that specifically deal with horrors that we're not going to go any further details on. This is just the stuff where they got caught. When when that Ariel Toaf goes back through the history of recorded murders of Christians by Jews to steal their blood for blood magic rituals. Those are just the times when they got caught. That's not the only times that they did it. That was the times where there was sufficient evidence that everyone agreed, yes, this actually happened. And, you know, when I said one of the earliest examples from was from like 415. The later examples are from the 20th century. This stuff is still going on today. And if you, if you find that shocking, think back to what we found out was going on with Epstein and with that entire circle, with the paintings and with the rooms and the chambers and what was called Pizzagate. And everyone's told, oh, that's just a conspiracy theory. Well, if you know nothing else, yes, it's unbelievable. If you know the history of these people and you start noticing the last names of the people involved, you take a second look because, it's frankly, it's, it's the only logical conclusion. And then when examining the evidence, it's, it's literally the only conclusion. These people are guilty of things that we would never conceive of. And that's part of why it's important for these heinous details that he provides in some of these middle chapters are important for us to read. Because if you don't know the evil you're facing, you're never going to respond appropriately. When someone comes along in soothing tones and said, hi, I'm your Judeo-Christian friend. I'm from the other side of the tract, but we worship the same God. We just have different approaches. Don't, don't worry about it. You know he was taught as a child to murder the goyim. That's, that is what they're taught. It is what they believe. And there's video to this day of little Jewish children in their own schools laughing and talking about how excited they are at the prospect of killing non-Jews. It's part of their religion. And it's part of the religion that's concealed by the language barrier. It's one of the reasons that the translation of the Talmud was such a pivotal moment in history, because these things were secrets. And it's one of the points that the, the historian who d documented the so-called blood libel incidents makes very clear. The specific details in the accounts could only have possibly come from Jews, because all the practices were completely hidden. The Seder meal, which incidentally was part of a satanic worship practice, the, the specific details that were revealed in some of the interrogations of the Jews who are guilty of these things could only have come from a Jew. It couldn't have been made up by an accuser trying to falsely accuse a Jew of something he didn't do. Only someone who knew the intimate details of their secret of religion would have been able to divulge them. So for that reason, I commend the whole book, but I simultaneously warn you, you there's, there's stuff that's going to be hard to read. And as Corey said, you need to know, particularly as a man, as a husband, as a father, you need to know what you are facing as, as a blood enemy, as a mortal threat to your family, to your civilization. And that's really, that's the crux of the book in its entirety, is that once you understand the threat that we're facing, it recontextualizes how we respond to it. If you just think that these are doctrinal disagreements, 
it, you know, it's a church fight. When you realize that civilizations are rising and falling as a result of these battles, you have to take a different approach. And that's that's where the book concludes. There's some of the conclusions I don't really want to get into because, frankly, they're things that today people are getting th- thrown in jail for. And it's not a matter of cowardice. It's just you can draw your own conclusions. I'm not going to—I don't need to bite a bullet for something that isn't isn't going to move the ball. Read the book. Deal with the facts as they're presented and draw your own conclusions. But just be aware that when you're talking about everyone from Darby to Schofield to Jerry Falwell to Netanyahu, all on the same page, all saying the same things, and then DeSantis is passing laws saying you can be thrown in jail for disagreeing, that's real. You can go to jail for it, and you'll die in prison for it. There are a bunch of J6 prisoners who've died, some by their own hands. That's Those are the stakes. This stuff is not academic, and that's that's why I'm glad that we were able to tackle this book today because this stuff is it's consequential and it unfortunately it's timely because it's it's unfolding right before our eyes on in the news today. But like I said, it's still going to be current in a few years because until these people are ended, until they're stopped in their evil, they will persist. They made clear for thousands of years they will persist in evil as long as they're permitted to do it. And so as Christians. We have to decide how to respond to that faithfully. It's good that we've gone into some detail on some of the chapters. We're going to leave some as kind of a tease for you as listeners. Uh, chapter 10 on ethno-nationalism. I, Corey and I both despise this word because it's redundant. There's no such thing as an ethno-nation. It's, it's a nation-nation. Natal is blood. Either it's a nation or it's a heterogeneous empire. The point is we need to get rid of the empires and get back to actually having nations. So I just as a framing issue, like he does he reaches good conclusions, but frankly, to say ethno-nationalism or ethno-nation is really ceding the frame to the enemy that there can be any other kind of nation. And there simply isn't. Either you're a nation or you're not. And right now we're not, not in any meaningful sense. We don't have our own lands, our we're being deracinated, being done forcibly in the church, in advertising and everything. Uh, so in, in that chapter, he covers some of the same ground that we've discussed in the past. Uh, talks about the passage about neither Jew nor Greek, uh, the flood and Noah's sons. Talks about Babel. It's a fairly short chapter, but it, it covers some important scriptural ground, and he does a good job there. In chapter 11, the title is Evangelism, At What Cost? Non-white, quote-unquote, Christianity. And in this chapter, he makes the argument that we referenced towards the beginning about the global South syncretism that really goes back to the beginning of colonization. Effectively, wherever Christian Europeans have brought Christianity to non-white nations, virtually all of them have engaged in such a high degree of syncretism, meaning incorporating Christian beliefs and practices in with their demon worship. That's what it is. That That's the syncretism. That's the, the syncretic part of it. You take you take a belief from one religion and add it to a belief from another. And you don't end up with Christianity because you can't possibly. There's only one God and there's only one path to heaven. So he makes an argument in this in this chapter that in all the cases where Christianity has been brought to these people, they have butchered Christianity. And one of the important things for Corey and me as we're tackling these subjects is that that's no excuse not to take the gospel to them. But it does raise the question, when you have taken the gospel to people who are only ever going to butcher it, if they're not supervised heavily, the open question, at least for me, is, are we obligated to heavily supervise them? Or is it sufficient to take the gospel and then set them loose? Corey has his opinions, I have mine. They're not not the point of, of this discussion, but I think it is interesting that this this chapter is a good companion to the episode that we did on race and IQ, where we took the same subject from a different angle, not talking about their spiritual inclination to syncretize with their pagan beliefs, their demonic acts. We took it from the perspective that they their IQs are so low that apart from any spiritual issues that these people may have, they're still not smart enough to actually do it. And we make the case there. So he doesn't tackle that. He tackles it from another perspective, which is is important. Again, these are complementary uh, presentations. Chapter 12 is titled Pro-Slavery Theology. Slavery is not a biblical sin. 
Uh, He does a very strong scriptural defense of the institution of slavery. He provides some good details on how masters in the South were held to account socially and legally if they abused their slaves. The one small criticism I have of this chapter is very clear that he is a Southerner, and proudly so. I don't have a problem with that. As I've said before, I'm a I'm from a mixed race marriage. My dad's a Yankee going back to Plym- Plymouth Rock, and my mom is a hillbilly going back to Plymouth Colony. So I was raised Yankee. I effectively am a Yankee, but at the same time, I have complete sympathy for the plight of the Southerner. And I understand where they're coming from when they're pissed about what was done in the War of Northern Aggression. The problem that I have with this chapter is that, one, he tries to make the slavery issue center around Yankee versus Confederate. And it's not really the subject of the chapter, but it's something that we see elsewhere, particularly in the dissident right and online. There's a lot of public antipathy of Southerners, typically in in one direction. It's usually people saying they hate Yankees. Which is really weird, because when you actually look at much of the prosecution of the war itself, you find a lot of Jewish names. And you find that a lot of the soldiers, as we all know, were were Germans and Irish. They were just fresh off the boat, and then they were sent down to kill Americans in the South, which was despicable and evil. But to call some guy fresh off the boat a Yankee is kind of goofy. Now, it was certainly the Yankees sending them, but the other conspicuous thing that's missing from this chapter that I, I found particularly weird in light of how well he handled the Jewish question in the middle part of the book, was that there's zero mention of Jews at any point in the slavery chapter, which I think is is a material omission because we know for a fact that a substantial portion of Southern slavery and slaveholding was tied to Jews. So his his framing is it's got to be Confederate versus Yankee, and it would really confuse that narrative to say that there were Jews present. I think that a more fleshed out historical approach to the subject, which is being to include all those things, that there were different things in the mix. And I don't want to say there were bad people on both sides because it, it was a war of Northern aggression. The, the evil was predominantly being done from the North to, to make it crystal clear. The South had every right to secede. They had every right to their own self-determination. It was wicked that that was prevented. I despise that as much as any Southerner because it was unjust. It was an evil thing on its face. I don't think that you have to hate Yankees 170 years later in order to make your case. But that that small quibble aside, it doesn't change the the really good job that he does treating the subject of slavery. And the last uh, section is theories of Christian violence, and he talks about pacifism. He does a good job uh, dealing with uh, turn the other cheek and warfare in Scripture. Next chapter, he deals with holy war. I find that a little bit of a strange shift to go from, basically he's trying to make the case that there, there is the justification for muscular Christianity that is not ashamed of having a national identity, one where a Christian nation exercises its Christian rights as a nation to do things that in some cases may involve violence against other nations. I wish I, I think if he knew more about Lutheran doctrine, you know, not to plug us, but some of the treatment that came out of the 16th century from some of the Lutheran reformers, I think has some material that would have helped him make a slightly different case. Because when you talk about holy war, that kind of limits what you can actually fight a war over. And I don't think a war needs to be holy to be just. You don't have to be liberating, you know, the Holy Land or something to say that. It is permissible and, in fact, necessary for a Christian prince to go to war to protect his people and his interests. The problem today is fundamentally we don't have Christian rulers, and when we do go to war, it's for the worst possible reasons. And then the uh, the last chapter, he's specifically dealing with uh, abortion and and the treatment of the unborn and legal responses to it, and. As I said, that's that's kind of one of the most fraught chapters in the book, simply because it will be treated as something that you can get into legal trouble for talking, for fleshing out some of the things that he says. And I don't fault him for it. I think that it's an important moral point to be made. And then there's also the legal reality that people want to see us dead, and any excuse will do. And a careless word is very easy to get you in a position where you can go to jail where you may die. You may be there for the rest of your life. 
for saying something that's entirely scriptural and entirely moral. But I think that, again, I think the meat of the book, for me at least, was the really well fleshed out work that he did dealing with the history of Jews and of Zionism and now that they're inextricable. The fact that dispensationalism was inserted into Christianity and is now shaping world politics is a huge deal. And he provides a lot of really excellent detail there. So overall, I think Corey and I both absolutely commend this book to anyone who wants to delve into some of these subjects. It's not perfect. And that's not a criticism. Like I said, like if I wrote a book, I don't think I would necessarily do as well as him. He did a really good job with the research and I, you have to give a lot of credit to someone who's willing to put in this time. So again, as, as we make these relatively small criticisms at different points, I don't think any of them detract from the book. And, and I think that's a crucial point, but as you're reading them, it's, it's important for you to draw your own conclusions. I think that the facts that are presented, there's only one possible conclusion about those facts. You you will become very angry because any Christian, any decent human being would become very angry reading some of those. And some of the other stuff is just very interesting, informative history. Like, wow, I had no idea. But then when you see the arc of history plotted out, suddenly the things we see today make perfect sense because we can see where they came from, where without someone drawing you a straight line or maybe a squiggly line in some places, you wouldn't necessarily notice. And so it's it's a very valuable book. I'm I'm glad that Anlo Pill has published it. And I'm I'm very thankful to Giles Corey for for writing it because it's important for there to be Christian voices in this space and for us to be frank, you know, just as is when we approach these subjects, we we go into as not much details as necessary. Again, it's no criticism of him in some cases going into great detail. This is a place for it. You do that in a book when you're, you know, you can't really skip ahead nearly as easily, easily in a podcast. And some of the scuff is, is frankly, it's kind of scarring. That's important. You are not permitted to be ignorant of how evil the world is as a Christian man. You need to know how bad things are because it's the only possible way that we as Christians can be faithful to God in preserving what he intends for us to have. So, Thank you to Taylor from Antelope Hill uh, for presenting this and giving us the opportunity. I Again, thank you for the free copy. I forgot to mention that up front. And we'll put a link in the show notes to the book itself. Uh, Corey's going to end with uh, a couple quotes from the book that uh, was referenced that I think really lay out a good case for why all this matters. Thank you guys again very much for having me on. Uh, it's been really great, and I hope that uh, I'm glad you guys enjoyed the book, and I hope people who are listening will enjoy it as well. I'm sure that they will. It's a good resource for an overview for a number of different subjects, and also does, as mentioned, dive into detail on some of them. From a Lutheran perspective, yes, I would have loved to have seen a reference to the Magdeburg Confession, which is a vitally important document in Christian history when it comes to resistance against unlawful or tyrannical authority but we'll eventually get into that in a different episode. Conveniently, in my case, I had already read basically all of the books of a scholarly nature that are in the, the footnotes in the book, so I happened to grab one from my shelves, and it is the Passovers of Blood book by Ariel Toaf. It is a scholarly work. It is very well done. I guess I can recommend it for some of the listeners. Like I said, it is a scholarly work. It is going to be a little on the dry side. It is technical. It is going to demand of you at least a little bit of knowledge of Latin. There are also some Italian, a few other things in here, but we're going to close with a couple passages from this separated by a number of centuries to give the right sort of framing and impression of things. On the eve of Passover 1144, the mutilated body of William, a child of twelve years, was found in Thorpe's Wood, on the edge of Norwich, England. No witness came forward to cast light on the savage crime. The child's uncle, a cleric by the name of Godwin Sturt, publicly accused the Jews of the crime in a diocesan synod held a few weeks after the discovery of the body. A few years later, between 1150 and 1155, Thomas of Monmouth, prior of the Cathedral of Norwich, reconstituted with plentiful details and testimonies the various phases of the crime, perpetrated by local Jews, and prepared a detailed and extensive hagiographic report of the event. These were the origins of what is considered by many to have been the first documented case of ritual murder in the Middle Ages. 
while for others it is the source of the myth of the blood libel accusation. The latter consider Thomas to have been the inventor and propagator of the stereotype of ritual crucifixion, soon to be rapidly disseminated not only in England, but in France and the German territories as well, fed by the information relating to the now famous tale of the martyrdom of William of Norwich by the Jews in the days of Passover. William was an apprentice tanner in Norwich and came from an adjacent village. Among the shop's clients were a few local Jews, who are thought to have chosen him as the victim of a ritual sacrifice, to be performed during the days of the Christian Easter. On the Monday following Palm Sunday, 1144, during the reign of King Stephen, a man claiming to be the cook for the archdeacon of Norwich presented himself in the village of William, asking his mother Elviva for permission to take William with him to work as an apprentice. The woman's suspicions and hesitation were soon won over, thanks to a considerable sum of money. The following day, little William was already traveling the streets of Norwich in the company of the self-proclaimed cook, directly to the dwelling of his aunt Leviva, Godwin Sturt's wife, who became informed of the apprenticeship undertaken by the child and his new patron. But the latter individual awakened numerous suspicions in the aunt Leviva, who asked a young girl to follow them and determine their destination. The shadowing, as discreet as it was effective, took the child to the threshold of the dwelling of Eleazar, one of the heads of the community of Norwich, where the cook had little William enter the house with the necessary prudence and circumspection. At this point, Thomas of Monmouth allowed another key witness to speak, one who had been strategically placed inside the Jew's house. This was Eleazar's Christian servant, who, the following morning, had by chance witnessed with horror, through the crack of a door left inadvertently open, the cruel ceremony of the child's crucifixion and atrocious martyrdom, with the participation, carried out with religious zeal, of local Jews, in contempt of the passion of our Lord. Thomas kept the date of the crucial event clearly in mind. It was the Wednesday following Palm Sunday, 22 March of the year 1144. To throw off suspicion, the Jews decided to transport the body from the opposite side of the city to Thorpe's Wood, which extended to within a short distance from the last house. During the trip on horseback with the cumbersome sack, however, despite their efforts at caution, they crossed the path of a respected and wealthy merchant of the locality on his way to church, accompanied by a servant. The merchant had no difficulty realizing the significance of what was taking place before his eyes. He is said to have remembered years later, on his deathbed, and to have confessed to a priest, who then became one of the diligent and indefatigable Thomas's valued sources of information. Young William's body was finally hidden by the Jews among the bushes of Thorpe. Ritual murder accusations have been made against the Jews for thousands of years. The murders were sometimes alleged to have been accompanied by ritual cannibalism, but not always. In every case, it is rather improbable that testimonies which have come down to us from antiquity were known, and disseminated in the Middle Ages, and could constitute a significant point of reference for later accusations of crucifixion and ritual cannibalism. As early as the second century before Christ, the almost unknown Greek historian Democritus, who probably lived in Alexandria, recorded a violently biased anti-Jewish testimony, at that time referred to under his name in Sweden's Greek Dictionary. According to Democritus, the Jews were accustomed to render worship to a golden head of an ass. Every seven years, they abducted a foreigner to sacrifice him, tearing the body to pieces. This horrible rite is said to have taken place probably every seven years in the Temple of Jerusalem, sanctuary of the Jewish religion. A report only partly similar to that reported by Democritus is found in the polemical Contra Apioni by Flavius Josephus, quoting the tendentiously anti-Jewish rhetorician Apioni, who lived at Alexandria during the first century of the Christian era. According to Apioni, Antiochus Epiphane, entering the temple of Jerusalem, is said to have been surprised to find a Greek, stretched on a bed and surrounded by exquisite foods and rich dishes. The prisoner's report was extraordinary and horrifying. The Greek said that he had been captured by the Jews, and taken to the temple and concealed from everyone, while they force-fed him on all sorts of foods. At first, the unusual circumstances in which he found himself did not greatly displease him, until the sanctuary attendants revealed the fate waiting in store for him. He was fated to die, the predestined victim of homicidal Jewish sacrificial practices. 
Quote, the Jews carry out this rite every year on a pre-established date. They catch a Greek merchant and feed him for a whole year. They later take him into a forest, kill him, and sacrifice him according to their religion. They then savor the viscera, and in the moment of sacrificing the Greek, they swear their hatred of all Greeks. They then dump the remains of the carcass into a ditch. Flavius Josephus reports that the history recounted by Apioni was not invented by him, but was rather derived from other Greek writers, an indication that its dissemination must have been much more widespread than we are led to imagine based on the two only surviving accounts, i.e. of Democritus and Apion. And we will end this episode with one other brief reading from this particular book. That Christian Europe of the Middle Ages feared the Jews is an established fact. Perhaps the widespread fear that Jews were scheming to abduct children, subjecting them to cruel rituals, even antedates the appearance of stereotypical ritual murder, which seems to have originated in the 12th century. As for myself, I believe that serious consideration should be given to the possibility that this fear was largely related to the slave trade, particularly in the 9th and 10th centuries, when the Jewish role in the slave trade appears to have been preponderant. During this period, Jewish merchants from the cities in the valley of the Rhone, Verdun, Lyon, Arles, and Narbonne, in addition to Aquisgrana, the capital of the empire in the times of Louis the Pious, and in Germany, from the centers of the valley of the Rhine, from Worms, Magonza, and Magdeburg, in Bavaria and Bohemia, from Regensburg and Prague, were active in the principal markets in which slaves, women, men, eunuchs, were offered for sale, by Jews, sometimes after abducting them from their houses. From Christian Europe, the human merchandise was exported to the Islamic lands of Spain, in which there was a lively market. The castration of these slaves, particularly children, raised their prices, and was no doubt a lucrative and profitable practice. <laughs>